God has revealed his presence in dramatic ways and changed so many people's lives, sometimes changing entire, entire communities and cities and regions and even nations when he's moved. And what I want to ask you to do is, is to, to kind of shift your mindset not only that this would be a continuation of what we've seen happen in the spring and summer, but that we would come into this with an awareness that there is much more than we've seen him do so far. And I want to ask you to be asking him to do more than we've seen him do so far in your own life, in our church, and then beyond. So I want to ask you to pray. Uh, if you're uh, acquainted with fasting, I want to ask you to fast. I want to ask you to be praying that God will do more in your own life, and more in our church. One of the things that we were, a number of us, talked about during all these services was just how, how, um, how powerful the presence of God was in those services. And just this awareness that when you walk into that kind of setting, you cannot be unaffected. Um, so I guess another thing that, that I want to encourage you to do is, is ask the Lord, who, who do you know that needs Him? Who, who needs to experience the presence of God like that? And try to get them here. Because we just feel like if, if God continues to move as He's been moving and even more, that when people come in who aren't walking with him, they're going to be powerfully affected by the presence of God. Uh, you know, we're thankful for what God has done, extremely thankful, but we just believe it's his nature that he wants us to be hungry for more of his work in our lives. He wants us to have faith for more, and he wants us to seek him for more. And all of that, none of those are selfish prayers. Those are all prayers that line up with the will of God. So I'm asking you, uh, will you take that on? Set that time aside. Uh, pray and fast. Ask God to increase your hunger and expectancy for what he wants to do. And then ask him who needs to be included in this. And with only three weeks, we're kind of, you know, just kind of getting started with, with the focus but we believe in all, with all he's been doing, we can turn our focus pretty quickly to what he wants to do in, the, in this conference. And so I want to ask you to do that and, and contend uh, in your own focus in, in prayer for, uh, for what God wants to do uh, during, during this next conference. But I want to read a couple of scripture passages to you today that I think are very, very important passages of scripture and are powerful in bringing real freedom and victory to your life. Philippians chapter 4 if you've been here a while, you've heard me share out of this, this chapter a lot of times. I think it's one of the most wonderful chapters in all the Bible. Paul writes this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Here's a good command for you. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Anybody need any peace? Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me, seen in me, put in practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. In one other passage, Jesus doing the parable of the sower and seeds in Matthew chapter 13. Verse 22 says this, The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries 
of this life. And the deceitfulness of wealth choked the word, making it unfruitful. You know, it's amazing all the things we can worry about, isn't it? I mean, we worry about the sun that is going to give us skin cancer. We worry about air vents that is going to blow mold into our lungs. We worry about too many carbs in the potato chips that we eat or the vegetables we eat. They've been sprayed with pesticides or the meat and the milk products. They've been injected with hormones. We worry about the economy. We worry about the stock market. We worry about our own finances. We worry about our relationships. We worry about our family. We worry about our children. A few years ago, a woman wrote into Reader's Digest and just said that one day she was stepped outside her yard and this, this old, tired-looking dog walked into their yard. He had a collar and looked well-fed, so he knew the dog. she knew the dog had an owner. But the dog was just very calm, very peaceful, just came right up to her. And when she opened her back door to go back in the house, the dog just walked right in with her. Walked down the hallway, laid down at the back, and went to sleep. And the woman just let him sleep. In about an hour, he got up, came back, nudged the door. She let him out, and he left. The next day, he appeared again and did the same thing, right down the hallway, laid down, took, went to sleep. Did it for a week, and she started getting curious. So after a week, she pinned a note to the dog's collar and just said, uh, your dog comes to my house every day to take a nap. The next day, the dog showed up again with a different note pinned to his collar that said, this dog lives in a home with 10 children. Can I come with him tomorrow? <laughs> When you have 10 children, you have a lot to worry about, don't you? We worry about our children. We worry about our marriages. We worry about our jobs, our friends, what the government's going to do. We worry about taxes. We worry about ISIS. We worry about Ebola. We worry about our quarterback. I mean, we can worry about just about anything, right? We live in a world that's kind of turned toward, toward worry. You know, you schedule a flight out of Birmingham and you stop to get gas on the way, you go in to buy a cup of coffee and there right by the counter is a paper that the headlines say attempted terrorist attack in Moscow airport. And you think, why did it have to be an airport today? And as you're walking out of the convenience store, you see this picture of a little girl that says missing under the picture and you think, that looks kind of like my little girl. You get on the highway and you see that there's an amber alert. So you start looking at all the suspicious looking vans. And you think you find one and you wonder if you should turn them in. But then you see another sign by the road that says 63 people have died in 2015 on Alabama highways. Buckle up. And you think, well, maybe they weren't trying to look at your sign. And then when you finally get to the airport, you got to go through all the security. And those people, not only do they seem like they're a little bit invasive, they seem like they're a little bit tense. And you're wondering, what's going on with these people that they're so tense? Then you hear a calm voice come over the intercom that says, the terrorist alert level has been set at orange. And you wonder, what is orange? What does orange mean? What color was it before? Should I be worried? Another voice comes over the intercom that says, be sure that you do not leave any of your bags unattended. And you see a bag that's unattended. And you worry, should I throw my bottle body over it so that when it explodes, nobody else will be hurt? Should I call somebody with a TSA? Then you notice it's a diaper bag and you see the mother and the child playing about 10 feet from the bag, but you've seen CSI Miami and you know you can't trust anybody. There's a suspicious man at your gate waiting for the plane. And when you get on, he sits right beside you. And you're wondering, can I take him down? Or is this guy going to overpower us and crash, crash this airplane into something that matters and take out me and a whole bunch of other people? The stewardess gets up and tells you about the oxygen bag that will drop, drop out of the ceiling if we start losing cabin pressure. And you think to yourself, do those things ever really work anyway? And then she starts telling you about the flotation device that your seat can be used as. And you think, you think, what does she know that we don't? We're not even supposed to go over water. Why is she telling us about the flotation device? So before the plane even takes, it, takes off, you're popping Ambien and you're breathing into a paper sack. Because we live in a world that's just surrounded by worry, by things to worry about, continually gives us things to worry about. And we all know worry is not good for us. I mean, really, worry doesn't accomplish anything, does it? Some of you think it does. Some of you get worried when somebody tells you not to worry. You know, 
I mean, you, you, you look around you at all these other carefree, irresponsible people, and you think to yourself, hey, if I wasn't here carrying all the worry for all the rest of you, you have no idea what would happen. Well, the truth is, worry doesn't change anything. That worry just tends to raise your blood pressure, and tends to cause ulcers, makes you more susceptible to heart problems, produces wrinkles, and gray hair or no hair <laughs> it robs us of our peace and joy and decreases our happiness it tends to cause us to focus on ourselves a lot when we worry it's not good for us psychologically relationally emotionally or even spiritually we just read that passage out of Matthew 13 the sower and the seed where it says some of those who heard the word received it Spring up, but they're choked out by the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth. In the middle of this, Paul says in this passage we read in Philippians, don't be anxious about anything. Some translations just say, don't worry about anything. Now, is that even realistic? Is that even possible? How in the world will we ever accomplish that? How can we not worry about anything? Especially, as I said, when we're surrounded by so many voices. You know, if you watch the news a lot, is it possible not to worry? And, and really, you don't even have to get to the news, do you? Just the commercials. You know, one commercial basically says, if you thought the last economic crash was bad, just wait to the next one. And if you'll write to us, we'll tell you, while everybody else is returning to the Stone Age, you can maintain your standard of living. Or you hear another commercial that says, if you took diet pills in the 90s, then you may experience heart problems, liver failure, kidney problems, and you start thinking to yourself, I took diet pills in the 90s. Goes on to say, if you'll write us now, we'll get you some money before you die. <laughs> And over and over again, all kind of things we can worry about, right? Your stomach starts bothering you. You remember you had a hamburger for lunch and you start thinking about mad cow disease. I mean, over and over, we hear, we hear all these warnings. And here Paul, Paul says, don't worry. I remember a number of years ago hearing about an older Jewish man who was facing surgery and he insisted that his son, who was a fine surgeon, do the surgery. And so his son is in the room with him as they're about to give him anesthesia and his father motions for him to come near and he says, what is it, Dad? And he says, son, I just want to tell you, don't, don't be nervous. You just do your best. Whatever happens, if, if, if something should go wrong and I don't make it, just remember that your mom is going to move in with you and your wife. And armed with that motivation, he felt comfortable going ahead and going under the anesthesia. Don't be anxious about anything. Don't worry about anything. More, even, even more amazing when you consider Paul's circumstance when he's saying this. He's in a Roman prison, writing the letter to the church at Philippi, awaiting his sentence, really, that could end in death. In that circumstance, Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Don't worry about anything. Now, how, can, how in the world can he say that? You know, this is the same one who said, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Angels, demons, powers, principalities, things present, things, same, things to come, height nor depth. No, cre no creature in all creation can separate us from the love of God. I mean, Paul had been saved when he was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. You remember, he was blinded by a light, and then he heard God speak to him. And he stayed blinded for three days until the disciple came to him in Damascus and prayed over him and his sight was restored and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then Paul was, went on this incredible 
journey of building the church of Jesus Christ. Think about all the things he had experienced. I mean, he, he had seen God move and bring multitudes into the kingdom of God. He had been stoned and left for dead and then raised up. Beaten, imprisoned many times. He and Silas had been in, in stocks and in chains in a dungeon when an earthquake came and the chains fell off. The jailer there at Philippi almost killed himself and Paul said, don't harm yourself, we're all still here. He and all his family gave their lives to Christ. Paul had been shipwrecked, floating in the open sea. Then if you remember in Acts, he got to an island and as they're building a fire, a poison snake comes out of the, the wood that he's putting on the fire and bites him and he shakes the snake off and all the people in the island think, boy, this must have been a really bad criminal. He started to escape and, and then the gods made sure he's going to die, but nothing happened to him. And then you remember they changed their mind. They think he must be a god. <laughs> Paul gets to preach to them and say, we're just men like you, but we come to declare Jesus Christ. See, Paul had experienced all this. And in all he had been through, he could say this. (laughs) Well, not exactly that. Good timing there. Some of you were here one week when a phone went off just at the right time and it had just the right tune on it. I thought, you know, we just need to get people to orchestrate their phones for special effect. When I make certain points, different tunes can, go, can just go off all throughout the congregation. You know, Paul had experienced all this and he could, he could, he could say this. It's nothing to worry about. <laughs> He's on cue. There's nothing to worry about here. <laughs> And all he had gone through, he knew that God was faithful. And so in this this passage in Philippians 4, we get some of the really profound keys to living a better life. Living a life of peace and joy. Living in victory over worry, which is one of the weapons of our enemy, by the way. And one of the weapons of our enemy to keep us from walking in faith, from stepping out, from living in victory, is worry. And so Paul says here, rejoice always, continually expressing joy. Listen, Paul doesn't say here, rejoice in your feelings. You're not going to always feel good, you know that? In this life, you're not going to always feel good. He doesn't say rejoice in your circumstances. This side of heaven, your circumstances are not always going to be good. It is rejoice in the Lord, always. Because he's always good. And he's always victorious. Rejoice in the Lord, I'll say it again. Don't be anxious about anything. Now, notice again, Paul doesn't say don't feel a certain way. Don't be anxious. How do you do that? Well, part of it is you stand against and over your feelings and your circumstances. You determine that we will not be controlled just by what we feel or by the circumstances going on around us. But we have a measure of control and choice when it comes to being anxious and when it, to, when it comes to worrying. When we f- have those feelings of worry, we stand against them. When we have those feelings of anxiety becoming anxious, we stand against those. We don't just receive them and let them reign over our, our, that day of our lives. We go to the Lord. We rejoice. Don't be anxious about anything. Some of you love going to the original Greek and you can get a lot out of that. You know what anything means in Greek? It means anything. <laughs> don't be anxious. Don't worry about anything but in everything, by prayer and petition, let your requests be made known to God. What all does everything include? Everything. Absolutely. In everything. Take everything to God. 
Now, you know why this is a challenge? Because when we feel bad or when we feel worried, we don't usually feel like going to God. But if we're going to overcome, we have to choose to obey even when we don't feel like it. So he says, in everything, prayer and petition with thanksgiving. With th Do you know that you can rejoice and thank your way out of worry? You can rejoice and thank your way out of sadness and out of depression. Because when we continue to rejoice and praise and give thanks, our focus shifts to the goodness and glory of God. And when our focus is really on Him and we begin to come into His presence, it's hard to be anxious. Have you noticed there's not a lot of anxiety in here when we're worshiping the Lord? <laughs> because our focus is on him. And then he promises us peace that rules, that can rule our, our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then he tells us this, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is excellent, think about these things. Let your mind go there. Instead of your mind going on all of the dangers and hazards in the world around us and all that might happen someday, let your mind focus on the things that are good. The things that build up, things that are true, the things that are right, the things that lead you into victory. Isaiah 26.3 says, talking to God, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. You know, a psychological test was done a few years ago where a number of people were presented with the scenario of a movie and there, as, as you're watching this movie, it said, he, they said, just imagine that you're, you're looking at a family traveling. They're all in a car. It's snowing in the background. And then on the radio, Jingle Bells comes on. And the kids start singing. And the father turns the radio up. And they all start singing. And they're all smiling. And then the scene switches. And the question to all the people was this. What does the scene switch to? You know, 60% of the people in this study said it was an accident. It went to an accident. From everybody smiling and singing jingle bells, it went to a car accident. Another, that's 60%. Another 10% were more creative, but it was still a catastrophe. Like, it shifts to the father in a hospital bed where years have passed, and now his children are all standing around the bed as he's dying. Another said it shifts to the grandmother's house. They've made it there, but the serial killer shows up and kills all of them. And then another really creative person said it shifted to a shark, shark attack. They're all, they're all devoured by a shark. So jingle bells to Jaws, you know, in an instant. Uh, that's somebody who's been walk, watching too much of the shark week, I think, when they go from jingle bells in the car to a shark attack. But, you know, that's, that's the mentality in the world. You know, what's, what's the worst thing that could happen? Here everybody's happy, Christmas, singing, snowing. What's going to happen next? 70% of the people say, well, it's got to be bad. <laughs> you know, if it looks this good, the next scene's got to be bad. You know, that's not how God has called us to live our lives. One of the best things that Jesus had to say about worry was in Matthew chapter 6. In that chapter, he says this, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let me just say here, don't worry. Don't worry about your money and about your stuff. I tell you, do not worry about your life. That's pretty big, isn't it? Jesus says, don't worry about your life. What you'll eat, what you'll drink, about your body, what you will wear. You ever worry about that? You see Vogue magazine or whatever else and people look perfect. They're airbrushed, of course. They don't really look like that. And many of them are much more miserable than anybody else you know. We know that's true. And yet we live in that kind of culture that causes us to worry about things that don't matter. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. It's not life more than food, your body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. But your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? 
Why do you worry about clothes? See the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his splendor was not dressed like one of these. If this, if this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith? Faith? Worry? Versus faith? So do not worry saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? The pagans run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows you need them. He doesn't say don't pursue them at all. He says don't worry about them. Your Father knows you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Dr. Ben Witherington at Asbury Seminary said there are two things every Christian should at least get out of these words of Jesus. One is that worry is absolutely useless. Worry does not prepare you. and It does not insulate you from difficult things in life. All it does is rob you of the present peace and joy and will of God. Secondly, it's not even Christian. This is what pagans do. <laughs> Right? This isn't what he's called you to do. Seek first his kingdom. Listen, you've got to get in the kingdom. You've got to pursue righteousness. Doing right, being right, walking in the will of, will of God, doing what he's created you to do, called you to do. And listen, nothing will remove him from his throne. You know that? Nothing that happens will remove God from his throne. And Jesus says here, look, God even takes care of the grass in the fields. He takes care of the birds of the air. He cares, he even cares for the animals. Even cats, apparently. <laughs> and if he cares for them, isn't he going to care for you? <laughs> so give it to God I heard this week that 90% of Americans worry about their money at least once each day daily 90% the Lord says let it go you ever watch somebody bowling for the first time, we used to, when I was a youth pastor, and a lot of times we take, you know, sometimes we take our youth. We have a lot of times we have people who had never bowled before. Have you ever watched somebody who took the bowling ball back, and they started forward, and they didn't let it go? You know? <laughs> I mean, either it stuck on their fingers, or they just didn't quite get it. They didn't let it go. Sometimes it just kind of carried them. I've seen several kids do that before. You know? That's kind of what worries like, carrying around this 15-pound ball all the time, and the Lord is just saying, let it go. Seek first because if you'll seek him first you can trust him to take care of everything that needs to be taken care of I love that scene of Jesus in Matthew 8 who's asleep in the boat when a suddenly a great storm comes up and waves are washing over the boat and the disciples are in panic what's Jesus doing he's sleeping they wake him up he rebukes the storm everything's calm Panic or peace? See, Jesus knew everything was okay because his father was with him because he was in the boat. And when you know the who, Paul says this too, when you know the who, you don't have to worry about the what or the when or the how. Craig Groeschel says that when one of the early staff members came on, he was leaving corporate offices of Target to come on staff at their church and taking a big pay cut and they, the, the, the staff and some of their leaders decided to build a house for him so he could make that move. They did the building, either subcontracted or did the work themselves, which was kind of a neat bonding experience, but when it came time to turn on the electricity, nobody quite wanted to do it. In fact, you know, Craig said, hey, I was the lead pastor, I couldn't do it. 
and Sam was the executive pastor. He couldn't do it. We started kind of going down the, staff, the list of the staff. Brian was the youngest and newest staff member, and quite frankly, the one we could most, could most do with losing if something happened. So Brian got nominated, and he turned the electricity on with a broomstick. Several years later, he said, we had another guy who left another career to come on staff, and we did it again. We built a house for him. His name was Kevin. But Kevin previously had been an architect. And so he said, now we had the who who knew. <laughs> and so we weren't worried. He said, if, if, if Kevin had told us to turn on the power with our tongue, we would have done it because he knew what he was doing. It was all about who was in charge. And that's what it's all about with freedom from worry. Who is it who's in charge? Philippians 6, 4, 6, and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You can give it all to God. Trust Him with your money. Trust Him with your job. Trust Him with your children. Trust Him with your relationships. Some of you dread holidays. You've got to go see that psycho relative when you go to the reunion. Give the psycho relative to God. Give it all over to God. It's his. Put it in his hands and his kingdom and you don't have to worry about it anymore. You know, in this passage, Paul gives us a couple of the greatest secrets in life when he says, I've learned the secret of being content in every circumstance. I preached on contentment in August. If you miss it, you ought to go order the uh, CD when you leave. Contentment, enough, at peace. And he says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Beth Moore said that for a while she went through a period where she was kind of gripped with this fear over losing her husband. And she just one day got in a conversation with God and said, Lord, if my husband died, I don't know what I would do. I don't know how I would go on. And she said the Lord kind of said back to her, well, what if that happened? What would happen? She said, well, I would just be numb. I know my friends would help me. Well, what then? Well, she said, I probably wouldn't get dressed for a month. I'd just sit and cry. And the Lord said, what then? She said, well, I probably wouldn't do anything for another month. month. Well, what then? Well, sooner or later, sooner or later, I'd probably, help, I'd probably ask you for help. And you'd help me get on with life. She said, the Lord said to me exactly. Why are you worried? John Wesley once said, I have never known more than 15 minutes of anxiety or fear. Whenever I feel fearful, a fearful, fear, I'm sorry, whenever I feel fearful emotions overtaking me, I close my eyes. And thank God that he is still on the throne, reigning over everything. And I take comfort in his control over all the affairs of my life. Never more than 15 minutes of worry or anxiety. See, Paul said to live as Christ, to die as gain. My life is not my own. Whatever is his, whatever is in his kingdom, is his responsibility. It's not ours anymore. Now, when we're holding on to it, we're going to worry about it. He's telling us to turn everything over to him. So he gives us all these keys. Give thanks. Praise God. Rejoice in him. Spend time with him often. It's hard to worry in the presence of God. And when we're attacked with anxiety and worry, go to God. Go to God and surrender and receive. And give it to him. Who does your life belong to anyway? What are you holding on to that makes you worry? See, when, when my identity is in my own hands, then I'm going to worry about it. And see, he's called me to give it to him, to put it in Christ. And when it's really his, I can trust God with my identity. Or my money. See, if my money is mine, it's a lot to worry about. When it's his, he can worry about it. He can take care of it. If my stuff, my possessions are mine, I worry about what happens to them. 
I give them over to God. They become a part of his kingdom. They're his. My job, I need to give it to God. My reputation, it needs to belong to him. My security, is that what I'm going to worry about or am I going to put it in his hands? What about my family? All the terrible things that could happen to my family members. It's God's family. Is it mine or is it his? My fun, my recreation, how I look, whether I'm a success in this life, how success is defined, is that mine? Is that my responsibility or is it God's responsibility? My purpose? My future? My health? My home? Are they mine? Are they his? What are you seeking first? Is it his kingdom? Are you his? Because if you're not, you will worry. And you'll be anxious. But that's not what God made you for. And it's not what he's called you to. He's called you to trust in him. And when your life is in his hands, when you give it over to him, you can say with Paul, my life is not my own. To live is Christ. To die is gain. I can trust God even with my life. I don't have to worry about it. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I can't preserve it by worrying about it anyway. So when it's his, it's his responsibility. And I don't have to worry anymore. So what about you? What are you worried about? What have you not given over to God? Or what have you taken back from God? And listen, I know for many of you it's a battle. It's a battle we're called to fight. And it's a battle that we can win by the power of God. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Just stand with me. We're going to close in just a minute. But I'd like you to just bow your head for a moment first. And I want to just ask you that question again before God. What are you worried about? Will you give it to God today? Maybe you've given it before, but taken it back. Maybe you've never given it over to him. You see, he wants to keep us in perfect peace. To know the joy of the Lord that's our strength. It only happens when we seek first his kingdom. When we put our life in his hands. So what about you? your relationships in his hands, your future, your past? If not, today is the day to say, Lord, I give this to you. You created me anyway. You give me every breath. I give my identity to you. I give my looks to you. I give my image to you. I give my relationships to you. I give my money, my possessions. They're not mine. They're yours. My life. Because when we give it to him, he gives us himself. And he sets us free. And the peace of God that passes understanding rules our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This altar is open. It's a great place to turn things over to him. And if he's speaking to you about doing that, then you come on now. Come on now. And just kneel and turn it over to God. You need the altar team to come. Some of you, maybe you need help letting go. And they can help you do that. Nothing magical about this altar, but it's a great place where a lot of people have found tremendous victory and transformation in Christ. And so if he's drawing you, you come. And especially if he's drawing you and you're afraid to come, you need to come. Because coming is what breaks that fear and opens the door for God to move. 
Have you put everything in His hands? Some of you, you know, this is all pretty new. You haven't really given your life to Christ. You haven't really asked Him to forgive you of your sin, come into your life. He brought you here today so you could do that. And I'm going to lead in a prayer for those of you who that describes. And if you want to be included in that prayer, I want to ask you to just lift your hand. I'm going to pray right quick, but lift your hand and keep it up to I'll make eye contact with you if you would again. This is just a way that we connect a little bit more. Yes, in the back there and two here. Thank you. For, in the back here and here and right here and right here and in the back there. Three people right back there. And right over here, and right here in the front. Anybody over here? Yeah, I see you over there. Uh huh. Anybody in the balcony? Yeah, I see back there. And over here, thank you. Anybody else in the balcony? And over here, yeah. And over here, yeah. Back there, yeah, I see. You. Anybody else? Yeah. Lord, you see our hands and you see our hearts and we just join together as a congregation in prayer. Lord, we're asking for forgiveness for every sin. We want to follow you. We want the sin out of the way and I thank you, you bore our sin on your own body on the cross and no matter what we've done, no matter how much we've done, the blood of Jesus is powerful enough to cleanse us. You bore our sin on your body so we ask for that cleansing now in Jesus' name. Cleanse us, wash us, and make us whiter than snow. Now, of every sin, cleanse us in Jesus' name. We're inviting you to come into our lives. That's what you made us for. So, Lord, as we open up our lives to you, come into us. Put your spirit in us now. Lord, we, we give our lives to you. We give our lives to you. Lord, I ask for everybody who prayed that, that you would give them an assurance, an assurance that they're forgiven and that you are in them. And we thank you and we rejoice in you. I just want to ask all of you, just, just give thanks to the Lord. About 15 people just lifted their hands. Just give thanks to God for the people who just, who just asked Jesus to forgive them. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you hear our hearts. How easily we give in to the, the weapon of, of worry. And you don't want us wound up in worry. You don't want us wound up in anxiety. You have called us to peace. You've called us to joy. You've called us to victory. So, Lord, we just want to put it all in your hands to seek first the kingdom, that nothing else would take priority. Lord, give us the grace now to release and let go. Lord, just to, we're yours. We're bought with a price. We're not our own. We're bought with a price. You created us. You're giving us every breath. We're here for the praise of your glory, for your purpose. We just give it all in your, put it all in your hands. Lord, our health, our families, our relationships, our finances, our past, our future, the whole list. Lord, we just, with all we know, we give them to you now in Jesus' name. And we release them. And we receive. We receive the peace of God that you take care of your own. You keep all your responsibilities. Those things are not our responsibility. They're yours. Our responsibility is to seek you first. So Lord, I ask that over all of these people, you would pour out now your peace that as we leave this place, we would leave in freedom, rejoicing in you, confident that you are faithful and that you're good, that we have nothing Nothing to fear, nothing to worry about, nothing to be anxious about. We receive your peace and your victory. If you need somebody to pray for you, you come and join us here. May God bless the rest of your day with his joy and peace in the name of Jesus. We